The voyage of the Beagle was by far the most important event of my life. Indeed, it determined my whole career. But if anyone should ask my advice before undertaking a long voyage, my answer would depend on his possessing a decided taste for some branch of knowledge. For the passing pleasures of the moment do not always counterbalance the evils. What are the glories of the illimitable ocean? A desert of water, as the Arabian calls it. Even the greater number of sailors, it appears to me, have no real liking for the sea itself. As for me, the misery I endured from seasickness was far beyond anything I could have guessed at. It is no trifling evil cured in a week, as some people suppose. The real misery only begins when you're so exhausted that any little exertion makes a feeling of faintness come on. Slack up the forecast brace! We're taking the gallants, Mr. Wickham. Not the gallants, sir, but we're making a wonderful way in this breeze. Do as I say, Mr. Wickham. Aye, aye, sir. Mr. Boston, take in the gallants. Aye, sir. Take in the gallants. Mr. Musters. Aye, sir. See if you can persuade Mr. Darwin to come on deck. asking if you join on deck, sir. In a few minutes, Masters. Right, sir. All in the weather main brace. to find your sea legs, I'm glad to see. I'm not so sure. By the time you reach the South American coast, you'll have the stomach of any admiral. They say Nelson never got over it. Do they now? Well, you see those men? Every one of them was as sick as a baby when he first came on board, and now look at them. Just to look at them makes me feel ill. They say you slackened sail just for my sake. That was kind of you. We shall soon make up the lost time. You should be changing tack in about half an hour. After that, the faster she goes, the smoother she'll ride. In the meantime, it's best you stay on your feet. I shall be doing my round shortly. Best to come in. On your feet! Come on, move! On your feet! Middle watch, Captain. At ease. I hope you're all as comfortable as space permits. 
any man with a genuine grievance should present himself on the quarter deck tomorrow morning. Carry on. Aye, sir. Carry on. Fitzroy's authority was beyond question. I would never have believed the extent to which every officer and man felt the slightest rebuke or praise. It was amusing to see hands hauling at a rope, not supposing him to be on deck, and then observe the effect when he uttered a syllable. It was like a string of dray horses when the wagoner gives one of his awful smacks. Two points to starboard. Two points to starboard, sir. With 70 officers and men packed into that tiny vessel, getting on terms with my fellow shipmates was the first lesson I was obliged to learn. On deck, metal watch. We also had on board the three Indians that Fitzroy was planning to return to their homeland in Tierra del Fuego. They spent most of the day on deck in their best European clothes, and I never once observed any of them suffering from seasickness. Not remarking on the cleanliness of my ship, are you, Darwin? It's volcanic dust, Fitzroy. Oh. Well, I hadn't imagined it to be the household variety. If I could get a large enough sample, I might be able to tell where it came from. The Fort Organic Capstay's choked up with it, sir. I was up there this morning. Could he go up there again and get me a sample? Why should he? I'll do it gladly, Captain. Does it not occur to you? that members of my crew might have more important tasks to perform than dust-collecting expeditions up the foremast. One slip and a man is lost, Mr. Darwin. Have I your permission to go up there myself, Captain? Mr. Masters, you may need some assistance shortly. Aye, sir. Fitzroy. That brown dust contains dozens of different organic forms. Oh, uh, yes. That's extraordinary. 
I wonder where they come from. Are we nearer to Africa or South America? Well, this is our position. There. The African coast is closer, but the prevailing wind is from South America. Which means that all of these organisms could have originated in South America. Very probably. But why is all this light being blown around in the air? Well, why not? God made the wind. He can make it blow as he likes. Even sink my ship with it if he feels so disposed. Just imagine, if the beagle hadn't been here to collect it, all this would have just perished in the sea. Perhaps the fish have a taste for it. After all, all living things seem to depend for their survival on other things. Come in. You sent for me, sir. Ah, Covington. I've been thinking, Darwin. Once we reach South America, no doubt you'll be collecting a large number of specimens. Plants, insects and the like. Indeed, but it won't interfere with the running of the ship, I assure you. Oh, quite. Nevertheless, no doubt you'll be needing some assistance. I could spare Covington here from some of his normal duties. He could act as your personal servant, at least for part of the time. That is, if he has no objection. I don't mind one way or the other, Captain. There'll certainly be plenty to do. Labelling and cataloguing especially. But I'm sure I can manage, Fitzroy. I'd like to try, sir. I've had some education. You wouldn't find me wanting. Good. That's settled then. But the cost, Fitzroy, I insist you let me pay. No, we can discuss that later. That's all, Covington. I tell Lieutenant Wickham that I've agreed the new arrangement. Aye, right, Captain. On calm evenings, the luminous sea presented a wonderful, most beautiful appearance. The vessel drove before her bows two billows of liquid phosphorus, and in her wake was a milky train. The water, which by day is usually seen as a foam, glowed with a pale light. As far as the eye reached, the crest of every wave was bright. A stronger brew than the captain serves, eh? Another glass for you, Mr. Earl. Not that you appear to need it. Very civil of you, Mr. Wickham. Nothing like a few grogs to keep the ship on an even keel. Drink up, philosopher. You may not be feeling like it tomorrow. What does the weather hold now? Please the Lord, no more storms. No one ever died of seasickness. I shall be the first. I shall make medical history. The sun will shine tomorrow, never fear. About noon, by my reckoning, might be the right time to make yourself scared. <laughs> Scarce on this ship. You couldn't hide a penny piece. But why tomorrow? I think Mr. Sullivan's hoping you haven't been in these latitudes before. He knows very well I haven't. Ah, well, you see. Tomorrow, given a fair wind, we cross the line. <laughs> and if you've never crossed the line, you couldn't pick a better way to do it than on one of His Majesty's men of war. But there are certain traditions to be maintained. Savage and barbarous customs, Darwin. Their meaning buried in the mists of time. Captain Fitzroy, it pleases us to bestow the godship upon you. I thank you, Father Neptune. What fools these sailors make of themselves. Blindfold him and proceed with the ceremony in a manner befitting his high standing upon this vessel. I understand he is a friend of the captain. I was. Strike up! Mr. Covington!
On the 28th of February, 1832, we reached San Salvador, the ancient capital of the Brazils. Stand by to take an old sail, Mr. Whitman. Stand by to take an old sail, Mr. Boson. Aye, aye, sir. Stand by to take an old sail. Take in all sail, Mr. Parson. Take in sail. Darwin. My own efforts at seamanship were admired by none, but on this grand occasion, even I was pressed into service. It was carnival time, but nothing daunted, Wickham, Earl and myself were determined to face its dangers. This is just the beginning of carnival. How long does it go on? About three weeks. Once a year they throw off their cares like an overcoat. The English never learned the trick of it. No, no, the Scots. The sensation of walking in the new world was quite marvellous, and I gave myself credit for not going crazy out of pure delight. I was prepared for the colour and gaiety of the tropics, but the actual experience proved more overwhelming than anything I had imagined. If human beings living in such lush and exotic surroundings could adapt themselves and respond to such different impulses from those I was accustomed to, then I could only wonder at the sights and experiences that must be awaiting me in the natural world. It was the first time that Wickham had been ashore, and he vowed that even if we remained there for the next six months, it would be the only time. Delight itself is a weak term to express the feelings of a naturalist who for the first time has wandered by himself in a Brazilian forest.
the elegance of the grasses, the novelty of the parasitical plants, the glossy green of the foliage, but above all, the general luxuriance of the vegetation filled me with admiration. The trees were often covered with woody creepers, and they themselves were covered by other creepers. Twiners and twining twiners, like tresses of hair. My mind was a chaos of delight, out of which I knew a world of future and more quiet pleasures would arise. If my eye attempted to follow the gaudy flight of a butterfly, it was immediately diverted by some strange tree or fruit. If watching an insect, I forgot it, in admiration of the flower it was crawling over. But even in the midst of all that wonderment, the habit of minute observation which I had acquired at Cambridge did not desert me. I made no conscious decision at this time to devote my life to science. As so often with me, the process was a gradual one. But looking back, I believe it was there, in the Brazilian rainforest, that my future path was set. The most striking aspect of the South American mainland was the complete absence of very large mammals like the elephant and the rhinoceros, which abound in Africa. Why this should have been so remained a puzzle which occupied my mind for many months. Indeed, some of the largest inhabitants of the rainforest are the little coates. These animals possess the ability to climb trees and move swiftly through the densest thickets. Chancing upon them as they were dining, I had the singular opportunity to observe the method by which they hunt. Using their sensitive nostrils to detect their prey, they then wield powerful claws to reveal the hiding place of their victims amongst the decaying vegetable matter of the forest floor. At this stage of our journey, I was content simply to observe, rather than make deductions. But again and again, I stopped and gazed at the beauties before me, in an endeavour to fix the impression on my mind.
Sooner or later the memory would fade. But like a tale heard in childhood, it might yet leave an image full of indistinct but beautiful reflections. In March we sailed south along the Brazilian coast and I transferred my attention to the creatures of the sea. Mr. Darwin, I seem to find you and your fish innards everywhere I go. This is the officer's mess, you know. We asked him in, Wickham. Sorry, Wickham, they asked to see my new marine specimens. Well, this is all very well, Darwin, but where are we going to put all this stuff? Before long, we'll look like a floating museum. Or a fishmonger's. It's the scientific mind, Wickham, forever cutting things out. The artist has a more civilised way of looking at the world. He's content to observe things as they are. You can't observe the digestive system of a fish simply by looking at it, Earl. Then observe the beauty of it and leave the simple creature alone. If I were the skipper, I'd have you and your damned mess out of this place. Most of it's not even fit for eating by the looks of it. Take a look at this one. You wouldn't believe that could get the better of a shark, would you, Wickham? It would take more than your word to convince me of it. Absolutely the case. Whenever it's attacked, it blows itself up like a ball. They've frequently been found alive and distended like this, inside the stomach of a shark. Very uncomfortable for the shark. That's just the beginning. It then proceeds to eat its way not only through the lining of the stomach, but through the side of the monster as well. You see, Wickham, David getting the better of Goliath. Exactly. Who would have thought that soft little creature could destroy the terror of the <laughs> oceans? <laughs> and what better reason for getting it off my ship? After two weeks of charting the coast in perfect weather, Fitzroy set a course for Rio de Janeiro. The scenery was magnificent. Nothing could have been more striking than the effect of those huge, rounded masses of naked rock rising out of the luxuriant vegetation. The ship was due to spend more than a month in Rio, and since Wickham was planning various bedevilments, such as corking and painting, I resolved to take Covington ashore and make a serious start on my collection of tropical specimens. In England, any person fond of natural history is delighted to have his walk interrupted when something attracts his attention. But in those fertile climates, teeming with life, the attractions were so numerous that we were scarcely able to walk at all. As to the vegetation, before the voyage, I could hardly tell a daisy from a dandelion, and it was positively distressing to walk in that glorious forest, knowing how much more benefit a knowledgeable botanist would have derived from it. Yet, in one respect, my very ignorance was an advantage, since I had no hesitation in transferring my attention from plants to insects, then back once more to plants.
The activity of ants in the tropics is truly astonishing. Well-beaten paths branch off in every direction, on which an army of never-failing foragers may be seen. These were the leaf cutters. Some going forth and others returning, burdened with pieces of green leaf often larger than their own bodies, which they had taken from a living tree or shrub. When attacking a plant, the ant turns its whole body into a tool, the jaws for sawing and the legs for gripping, like a vice. Even our ship's carpenter aboard the Beagle would have had to commend such precision. All South American spiders are poisonous to some degree, and this one, the hairy-bodied mygalomorph, was the largest I had yet seen, with the unenviable reputation of numbering lizards and sometimes even small birds amongst its victims. I took care not to become one of their number. Darwin, sir. Mm. She's a ground dweller. The feed and modify for digging. Covington must have thought he was with a man possessed as I set off in pursuit of more and more of the brilliantly decorated butterflies that fluttered lazily down the streams. Much of the prevailing noise in the forest came from the humble frog, and when several were together, they sang in harmony on different notes. On closer inspection, we found that this particular genus had small suckers at the extremity of its toes. I tested their effectiveness by placing the frog on my magnifying glass. It managed to hold on, even when the glass was placed absolutely perpendicular. Looking back, I can now perceive how my love of science gradually took over from every other taste. More and more I gave up my gun, and I discovered, though unconsciously at first, the pleasures of observing and reasoning were much higher ones than those of hunting and sport. <laughs> I've just discovered a most important error in the charts. There's a significant difference between the meridian distance from San Salvador here to Rio, as measured by the last French expedition and that measured by ourselves. It's a four-mile error in the longitude. Hmm. They must be wrong. Yes. Good. Never trust the French. Your patriotism is commendable, Mr. Wickham, but I didn't ask you in here simply to gratify it. We shall be returning to San Salvador. But, sir, that'll add nearly a thousand miles onto the voyage. No doubt.
Have we any reason to doubt our measurement? Almost certainly it's the French measurement that's in error. However, we came here with Admiralty instructions to chart the South American coastline. I intend to fulfil those instructions, to the letter. We shall spend three years in these waters, more if necessary. We may have some deserters, sir. That's as may be. But we shan't return until we have the first complete and accurate chart of the whole coast. Do I make myself clear? Sir. Very well. Now. Uh, yes? Ah, Darwin, just to say that we're heading north again to complete some unfinished business. But if you and Mr. Earl would prefer to remain here ashore at Rio and await our return, I've no objection. Well, perhaps... However, I must warn you, you may well be disappointed, even disgusted by the condition of the town. It is full of offensive sights and smells, and an uncivil population. Thank you for coming. We were now to be free from the confinement of life on board for several months, and I took the opportunity of growing a beard. Fitzroy had given Earl and myself an introduction to an Irish planter called Patrick Lennon, who owned a house in Rio and a large estate in the interior. I'll, uh, I'll wait with the baggage, sir. I'm sure Mr. Lennon would be happy to receive I'll you. I prefer to keep an eye on things, sir. You'd be hard put to find two more determined landsmen if you tried, Mr. Lennon. Earl is tired of the sight of the sea, and I haven't stopped being seasick since we left Plymouth. The floor is heaving beneath my feet at this very moment. Perhaps you'd better sit down, gentlemen. I see Captain Fitzroy failed to explain. Darwin's the naturalist aboard, and I am the artist. I trust you can both ride a horse. If it's possible to be horse sick, I probably will be. <laughs> This may sound rather an absurd request to you, Mr. Lennon, but if occasionally on the journey we could venture from the road a little, I would appreciate a good look at the vegetation. So, you want the shirt torn off your back in the real Brazilian forest? Lennon's estate was more than a hundred miles from the coast, and in order to give me a chance to collect specimens, we planned to spread the journey over several days. Covington. Look at this. Army ants. They'll attack anything that's put in their path. Watch this. If anything interrupts the column, see how they react. How can they do it? Do what, sir? Organize themselves. Imagine how small their brains must be. You want me to collect some, sir? No. I have a feeling the rest would follow us to the ends of the earth.
The day had been powerfully hot, with the thermometer in the shade reaching 84 degrees. As evening approached, we were glad indeed to reach one of the small inns that were situated at intervals along the route. Boa tarde, senhor. É um prazer muito grande vê-los. Um prazer enorme. É um prazer enorme recebê-los. Nossa casa sente-se honrada com sua presença. Qualquer coisa que os senhores pedirem serão atendidos. É uma honra muito grande. Uma honra muito grande. Obrigado, senhor. Covington? The place is being laid for you here. Very good, sir. I'll be over in a minute. Gentlemen, dining at the same table with their servants. I'm not sure Captain Fitzroy would approve. We can hardly be expected to recreate the officer's mess in the hinterlands of Brazil. Isn't it more than that with you, Darwin? I suspect you find our English class structure, shall we say, somewhat irksome? I don't know. It's evolved through the centuries. I see it as one way of organizing society. Like those ants we passed today. Each ant has a place in the system. Quite right. But human beings are more capable of change, are they not? I never heard of ants staging a revolution. Though I must say, they look as if they might have had the revolution already. If the climate changed, the ants would have to change with it. Or march off to somewhere else. It's harsh indeed. Don't trouble yourself about it, Mr. Darwin. They don't respond to kind of treatment any more than a mule. I was told before leaving England that after living in slave countries, all my opinions would be altered. So? The only alteration I'm aware of is forming a much higher opinion of the Negro character. You haven't been amongst us very long, Mr. Darwin. Uh, drink up, Charles. This is no evening for arguments. Take comfort from the fact that the earth is no longer heaving under your feet. during the night had ceased, and it was curious to observe the dense white vapor which rose like smoke from the valleys. Among the many creatures I was observing every day, the brightly colored caterpillars particularly caught my attention. Instead of hiding from their potential enemies, they contrived to look as fierce as possible. But even more remarkable, where some had poisonous hairs to protect them from birds and lizards, others did not. Their bristling armor might look just as fierce, but in truth, their whole appearance was a harmless pretense, apparently designed to confuse their predators. It took all my patience to seek out those creatures which escaped destruction by the opposite means of merging into their chosen background with almost uncanny deception. But even then it raised the question in my mind, if the Almighty had gone to such elaborate lengths to furnish them with a means of protection, why should he first have provided them with enemies at all? There were times when all nature seemed to me to resemble a cruel game. Darwin! Darwin! Charles, 
Come along. Not another bag from Darwin. I know now what they meant when they said you were a collector. We'll soon have to get another mule for you. After four days riding, we came in sight of the Rio Mackay estate. must eat every food. How big is your estate, Mr. Lennon? Uh, in breadth, about as far as you can see on either side. And in length? <laughs> I've quite forgotten. <laughs> and how many slaves do you need to work your land? I've forgotten that, too. <laughs> how many, Manuel? Oh, many, many. He looks after them well, doesn't he, Darwin? I can't deny it. These here look contented enough. One big family, one happy family. Mr. Lennon. You remind me of an oriental sultan who's forgotten how many wives he has. <laughs> I'm a good Catholic and I've got one wife and I'll trouble you not to be offensive. In Rio, I'm told, the authorities are trying to prevent slaves from being landed at all. How do you come by yours? Yeah, they're not easy to come by, but we manage somehow, don't we, Manuel? Yes, we had a new shipment yesterday. Good. All for your Figueiredo. What? For the Figueiredo estate. Uh, Sr. Figueiredo choose them himself. I choose which slaves shall stay here and which slaves shall go. Senor Figueiredo particularly wanted the married couples. Figueiredo will get what I choose to give him. Do you understand me, Manuel? Yes, sir. I understand. Good morning, Charles. Morning, Al. Started early, I see. Oh, yes. Too good to miss. separate the men from the women. Why split up families? An unfortunate circumstance, but it can't be helped. I need the men here. The women can go to Figueredo. He can use more women. But they will see their men again. Ah, hardly. The Figueredo estate's more than 200 miles from here. It's regrettable, but they'll forget soon enough. They're not married, you know. Not as we understand it. You believe that? I think you're being a trifle over-sentimental, Mr. Darwin. If I take my dog for a walk, he follows me gladly not knowing if it'll last for five minutes or three weeks. Come back in six months and see how they've settled down. Examples of enslavement may be found in the natural world, but to the best of my experience, only man has sought to enslave his own kind. Beneath the tiles of the slave quarters, I noticed certain wasp-like creatures stuffing the body of a half-dead spider into their nest.
They seem to know how to sting it just enough to leave it paralyzed, but still alive. In due course, they would lay their eggs on it and make the wretched, powerless creature serve as a source of food for the emerging larvae. The degree of cruelty is a factor of which nature seems to take no account. By the by, Darwin, I've taken the precaution of providing you with an extra mule. That's very kind of you. Just in case you continue collecting your specimens at the same rate on the road home. I'll go by, sir. Bye, sir. Bye. 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 In manners and position, I suppose Patrick Lennon would be regarded as superior to the common run of men. But on the subject of slavery, his mind was closed. There seems to be no limit to the blindness of self-interest and habit. Where did you manage to find all this stuff, philosopher? Oh, here and there, Mr. Wickham. And where the devil do you expect me to stow it? I'm sure you'll manage, Mr. Wickham. Once Darwin has catalogued it, it can all be sent to England from the next port. Come now, philosopher. They're tough, these blacks. I've been up country with Lennon myself, remember? You saw the blacks round his house? I did. Well, some of them seem contented enough. And the rest? I think one can become blinded by the natural gaiety of the Negro. Put yourself in the position of a slave, is right. With your wife and children torn from you and sold to the highest bidder like beasts. And for all his hospitality and courteous manner, Lennon is still capable of that. But they are of a different race from us, Darwin. Surely acknowledge that? I acknowledge that they are of the human species. In that, they don't differ from us. Should we not show them Christian charity? You're doubting my charitable Christian intentions? Of course not. One day, when I was with Lennon, for my specific benefit, he called together a group of his slaves and asked whether they were happy and whether they wished to be free. Every single one of them answered no. Oh, come, Fitzroy. Do you really consider the answer of a slave in the presence of his master to be worth anything? Are you doubting my word? There's no question of your... Are you doubting my word? Your word is not the issue. Is that of a slave in the presence of his master who owns him as you would own a dog? Get out! Doubt my word, but don't expect to share my quarters in this ship. Get out! So, the coffee pot boiled over. You could say that. We got into a stupid argument about Lennon and his slaves. And, and Fitzroy, naturally, was on the side of established authority. Well, he'll cool, never fear. But in any case, you're more than welcome to mess with us here. You're very kind, but I'm afraid it wouldn't do. It's been good enough for me all these months. Some rough company, of course. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't mean that. I've offended him deeply. I think it would be better for all concerned if I quit the ship as soon as I can. I know him better than you, and I'm telling you, he'll have forgotten the incident within the hour. But we were now to be overcome by a misfortune, which transformed my quarrel with the captain into a matter of trifling significance. A party of officers and men returning from a hunting expedition ashore had been struck by fever. Two died almost immediately. And now young Masters was gravely ill. Fitzroy, particularly, was very fond of him. But he was a favourite with everyone. He brought me a hot drink every morning and had done his best to make a sailor out of me. 
There was not a man aboard who lacked the imagination to put himself in the place of poor masters. But it was the captain who carried the full burden. His responsibility for the crew's safety bore heavily with him. And I began to see his occasional moroseness and austere silences in a new light. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Ghost be with us all evermore. Amen. Amen. Pipe the side. Musters was buried on the 19th of May, 1832. Three of that small ship's crew were now dead, and we were not yet a year out. How many of us, I wondered, would live to see the end of the voyage? And we continue in the footsteps of Charles Darwin tomorrow morning at One of them was as sick as a baby when he first came on board, and now look at them. Just to look at them makes me feel ill. They say you slackened sail just for my sake. That was kind of you. We shall soon make up the lost time. We should be changing tack in about half an hour. After that, the faster she goes, the smoother she'll ride. In the meantime, it's best you stay on your feet. I shall be doing my rounds shortly. Best accompany me. <laughs> on your feet! Come on, move. On your feet. Middle watch, Captain. At ease. I hope you're all as comfortable as space permits. Any man with a genuine grievance should present himself on the quarterdeck tomorrow morning. Carry on. Aye, sir. Carry on. Aye, sir. See if you can persuade Mr. Darwin to come on deck. asking if you join on deck, sir. In a few minutes, Masters. Right, sir. All in the weather main brace. Find your sea legs, I'm glad to see. I'm not so sure. 
By the time you reach the South American coast, you'll have the stomach of any admiral. They say Nelson never got over it. Do they now? Well, you see those men? The voyage of the Beagle was by far the most important event of my life. Indeed, it determined my whole career. But if anyone should ask my advice before undertaking a long voyage, my answer would depend on his possessing a decided taste for some branch of knowledge. For the passing pleasures of the moment do not always counterbalance the evils. What are the glories of the illimitable ocean? A desert of water, as the Arabian calls it. Even the greater number of sailors, it appears to me, have no real liking for the sea itself. As for me, the misery I endured from seasickness was far beyond anything I could have guessed at. It is no trifling evil cured in a week, as some people suppose. The real misery only begins when you're so exhausted that any little exertion makes a feeling of faintness come on. Slack off the forecast brace! Taking the two gallants, Mr. Wickham. Not the gallants, sir, but we're making a wonderful way in this breeze. Do as I say, Mr. Wickham. Aye, aye, sir. Mr. Boson, take in the two gallants. Aye, sir. Take in the two gallants. Mr. Musters. Fitzroy's authority was beyond question. I would never have believed the extent to which every officer and man felt the slightest rebuke or praise. It was amusing to see hands hauling at a rope not supposing him to be on deck, and then observed the effect when he uttered a syllable. It was like a string of dray horses when the wagoner gives one of his awful smacks. Two points to starboard. Two points to starboard, sir. With 70 officers and men packed into that tiny vessel, Getting on terms with my fellow shipmates was the first lesson I was obliged to learn. On deck, battle watch! 